Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Dan Monroe, Director and CEO of the Peabody Essex Museum. Founded in 1799 by America's first global entrepreneurs, the Peabody Essex Museum is the nation's oldest continually operating museum. Dan has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Dan, for joining us today. So, the Peabody Essex Museum, to me, is one of the great museums that a surprising number of people both know and have experienced, and a surprising number of people have yet to experience. Could you talk about sure. the, the genesis of the museum and where it is today? So, as, as you indicated, the Peabody Essex is the oldest continuously operating museum in the nation, uh, founded in 1799 by several of America's first global entrepreneurs, but it's also uh, been one of the fastest growing art museums in the nation over the last 20 years. And starting from uh, a position of virtually no recognition as an art museum, and now ranked in terms of many metrics among the top 12 to 15 art museums in the country in terms of operating budget, size of facility, and also uh, a museum that's achieved uh, international recognition for the quality of our exhibitions and programs and, and for a, a stance regarding innovation, which also has uh, been part of our identity in the last 20 years. So that being said, since we've grown from an operating budget of three million to what will be an operating budget of 36 million in, in, uh, in a few years, and an endowment of 23 million at the start of all of this, and it'll be more than 600 when we finish, and a facility of more than half a million square feet. All that's been compressed in an incredibly brief period of time, comparatively speaking. So while many people are familiar with us, many people are still becoming familiar, uh, in part because of the rapidity of that development. And the fascinating thing for me is the diversity of experience, the diversity of culture, is, is really built in to the DNA of the institution. Well, as far as I can determine, this is at, at the minimum among the first, if not the first, museums ever created by private citizens. Uh, it, it was the case for the British Museum or for the Louvre, for example, that those were national museums and they remain so. In the case of the Peabody Essex, this was private citizens coming together and making a commitment uh, out of their own pockets to not only establish and create a museum and make it free to their fellow citizens, but to collect uh, works of art and culture from beyond the Cape of Good Hope and Cape Horn. This is 16 years after the establishment of the nation. America was uh, hardly a well-developed, uh, sophisticated nation at that point, except perhaps politically. Really, the impetus for creating the museum was to help their, their fellow citizens recognize that America had a place in the world and that America could have a strong place in the world in the future because they were among a handful of people that were actually interacting with people, art, and cultures uh, worldwide at the end of the 18th century. So they had a, an incredibly cosmopolitan view of the world. They were much more familiar with uh, Calcutta or, or Canton than they were, frankly, with New York City or Philadelphia. So that DNA is built into the museum and through all of the subsequent 214 years, that commitment to being international has remained uh, you know, front and center. At the same time, we're clearly a New England institution and we have our roots in that uh, side of the equation as well. So this local global dynamic has been in play from the very beginning and is continuing as we, we look to the future. Our interests are uh, having done one major campaign, a major expansion project, uh, completely transformed facilities, finance, staff, programs, brand identity, to really, uh, and now we're in the midst of a, a, a new or $650 million campaign, which is among the largest uh, ever done by an American art museum, uh, and of which we've already generated gifts and 
commitments totaling about 570 million to do several things. One, to create a, a base for the future development of the museum that's quite stable in a very uh, fluid environment. So and it's sustainable. So it's sustainable. So this campaign is the only art museum campaign in which we're raising considerably more money for endowment than bricks and mortar. One of the things that I find to be so fascinating is the combination of discovery, entrepreneurship, hard-nosed business sense, uh, a, a commitment to art and artists, right. the idea of, of, tr of transcultural, multicultural approaches right. and learning from, from others that have different perspectives. And this is actually what you are currently uh, undertaking. You're, you're undertaking a transformation that if you brought that transformation back to the founders of 1799, right. they would find it to be very familiar. And I think they'd find it uh, quite a happy circumstance that after 214 years, uh, many of the basic core elements and kernels of, of their philosophy and ideas are still in play today. Uh, the second part of it, uh, in terms of this campaign, is that we're really dedicated to creating a 21st century art museum. And by that I mean a museum that uh, employs a lot of new ideas with regard to how art is presented and interpreted and the kind of experiences we create for people because our mission also is, is quite distinctive amongst uh, art museums. The standard art museum mission, although happily this is beginning to change, is to collect, preserve, interpret and to acquire outstanding art that uh, is made, quote, accessible to people. And uh, that's all fine, but I don't believe that it's a mission that will work in the 21st century, just making outstanding art accessible. So it's necessary, but not sufficient. It's, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient to actually make art and art museums a core and central part of people's lives. And in order to do that, I believe we have to create experiences, ideas, and information that really transform the way people see themselves in the world. And in order to achieve that, a lot of the kinds of practices that we've all employed for m many decades, uh, going back to the beginning of the 20th century, need to be changed. And particularly in the way that art museums uh, interact with people, the way they create opportunities and, uh, for people to interact with work, works of art, and it, it to recognize that there has to be a much richer kind of experience than we normally have provided in the art museum community. So you're competing in the world of ideas. You're competing with art museums, but you're also competing with other forms of, of, of entertainment, of education, of uh, enlightenment. Um, you need to compete and you need to win. So. Art has always involved technologies, it's always involved ideas, it's always reflected the culture of the place and time in which it's created as well as the individuality of the artist. And it's all been part of this interconnected manifold that uh, makes art so powerful. And in order for art to remain powerful in the 21st century, all of those things that have been during the 19th and 20th century, a good part of both, isolated and separated, be brought together. So we're committed to creating uh, experiences of art, culture, and creative expression, which involves many, many different fields, and bringing those together into an integrated kind of uh, experience. It, 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 if you're conceiving yourself in the business of creating experiences, ideas, and information, through art and culture. As opposed to putting an object in a place and looking at as it. As opposed to collecting, preserving, interpreting. Now, all those are important things, but they're not ends. Right. And the end, in our case, is to create these kinds of transformative experiences, where as a result of the interaction with art and culture and creative expression, which comes from many different fields, not just from performing arts or other arenas, 
is that uh, we, we're striving to create that transformative experience. And if that's the end point, and if you are expecting to be able to work effectively in all of those arenas, our culture, creative expression, then you have to have people with a lot of bandwidth. Right. Who are very creative, who are very committed, who are very knowledgeable in specialty fields, but also with broad-based interest. Fundamentally, you have to create a culture in which no matter what you do, if, no matter how successful it was today or yesterday, you're constantly committed to finding new ways to do it better or to new, new things that uh, help you achieve your mission and goals. So standing pat in a culture in which standing pat is not acceptable, uh, it creates an institution that's great for a certain kind of people and not the place to be for others. But uh, that's what we're committed to doing because there's no other way we know that you can actually create this broader spectrum kind of institution that we think will m assure that art and, uh, and art museums play a central role in the 21st century. It seems also that your approach is additive. It's an and approach as opposed to an or approach, right. meaning that there are some people who see the juxtaposition between a curatorially led institution and an, uh, a, 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 um, an institution that is led by the audience sensibility or education or programming or financial uh, considerations, um, that, that each of those areas stand in opposition to one another. What you seem to be saying is that it's an and. Um, it needs to be curatorially led and audience led and education needs to needs to come in there without pandering one to another without giving any ground I mean, curatorial excellence has to be defined in my view in uh, in several ways but among them it has to be that curators along with a lot of other members of the team because this is all a team based initiative and it's all integrated but they have to be concerned about the impact as, uh, on the audience as, as much as everyone else. At the same time, we're interested in adding new knowledge and therefore research and scholarship are extremely important. But it isn't, as you point out, a matter of either ors. The trick is to make it a matter of additive uh, combinations in which you're doing multiple things all at once and all uh, hopefully exceedingly well. And taking risks that only in retrospect are defined as good risks or bad risks, but at the time you're taking the risks, you don't know. Well, what we've found is that taking, you know, reasonable judged risks, not just flyers, flyers but pushing pretty hard on the envelope has worked extremely well for us. We never would have been able to, to come as far as we have in this comparatively short time otherwise because that's what actually excites people uh, who support us about what we are doing. And if you take risks, then you're certain to fail sometimes. Um, you have to accept that right up front. And you want to try to avoid that, but when it happens, then you want to capitalize on it and leverage it because, you know, that old adage about learning from your mistakes is actually really true. You can, in many ways, learn more from things that don't work from, than you can from things that do. And so you have to be willing to, to play that out. And, you know, it's kind of baked into the culture now. We don't actually spend huge amounts of time worrying about the risk that we're, we're you're not, taking. You're not sitting there wringing your hands. You're, well, you're we taking... Well, we spend a lot of time thinking about what's going on in the world, and much of that outside the world of art museums and the art community, and trying to understand what those interconnections may be. But um, as far as risk-taking goes, that's kind of standard procedure at this point. And, uh, and again, we try to make calculated risks, but uh, if you don't take those risks, then as far as we're concerned, you're certainly not going to go anywhere very interesting. It's very impressive to me how your board understands 
the, uh, the role of a board of governance, not management, right. but also they are willing to challenge and to uh, provide their own uh, sensibility, place their competence, their sensibility at your disposal. And I, I've seen that interaction result in some very interesting evolutionary ex uh, thinking on the part of, uh, of the entire institution. Right. That dynamic is clearly very critical because if you don't have a board and the CEO and the executive leadership team working in, uh, in consonance and striving to accomplish the same things and each contributing different parts to that initiative, um, you've got a problem. And assuring that uh, everyone is engaged in a way such that it again is a matter of uh, a collaborative effort rather than the old kind of hierarchical structure, which frankly has some necessary limitations on the way in which institutions perform, uh, makes a huge difference. And it's unquestionably the case. We never could have done the, the few things we've been able to manage uh, if we hadn't had that kind of relationship. Well, the few things you've been able to manage, let's put that into context. When you took this museum over, you you basically, you, your staff, your board, have orchestrated a shift from an institution that had a completely different identity right. to being a premier art museum with a particular brand recognition internationally. That was, you came in in, uh, I believe it was 1993. Correct. Then we met about 10 years later. Right. And at that moment, I don't know whether you remember, but at that moment you looked at me and you said, we're going to do another dramatic shift and you, you kind of right. called the date, and I said, well, that's, that's interesting. I wonder how he's going to do that. And then <laughs> I've watched this, this unfold, and it's a community, it's a group effort. I think one thing is really clear, and that is that no single individual, the CEO or anyone else, the chairman of the board, uh, can really truly lead advancement. And, in order to make exciting things happen that are important, it's very, very simple. It all depends on talent. And if you have you know, very, very strong talent, people that are sharing a vision for the future, uh, that's how things that are exciting get done. And we've been very, very fortunate to be able to build that kind of team, uh, particularly since that time when we first met. Uh, in terms of the senior uh, executive leadership team at PAM. And that team has dovetailed uh, extremely well, obviously, with our board of trustees and our patron support uh, base. So none of this happens really, and it's not, it wouldn't really very, be very interesting, actually, if it were just focused in one person or two people. It's really an effort that many people have made literally possible. The path that we're on and that we'll hopefully achieve by 2019 uh, when we complete this campaign and the expansion project and new installations of collections uh, and many other things will uh, really be a reflection of, of that reality. A great team, a great board, great leadership, fantastic collection, an amazing history and an amazing future. Don Monroe, thank you so much for thank sharing you. your experience with us. My pleasure. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for your insights. Thank you.